WMCHD3 Detroit, KMPS HD3 Seattle, WBMX HD3 Boston, and on AOL Radio and Yahoo Launchcast. Psychic Radio is now CBS Radio's The Sky. Back to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Call now 248 545 Soul. New SkyRadio.com. Believe. Can at least some of the troubles that come our way be attributed to ghosts? What about sickness? Why do so many people who are involved in the paranormal seem to have troubled lives? Hey there, and welcome to the 424th, I almost said 224th, 424th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I'm Ben, and those unnerving questions came from my co-host and, behind, and partner behind the paranormal, or in the paranormal, rather, my dad. Sorry, I, I feel like it's been forever since I've done this show. Well, you've been doing this one regularly. It's just, your school gets in the way of the Monday show. It's just, it, it feels like it's been a month since I've done the last show. Any hoodles. So this evening, we uh, welcome back our dear friend and out-of-the-box paranormal expert, Murray Silver. Well, over, under, around, and through the paranormal. Anyway, Murray is a fifth-generation son of Savannah, Georgia, very familiar to uh, our, our longtime listeners. One of America's most respected paranormal investigators. He's also a distinguished writer, publisher, historian, journalist, producer, and music promoter, and a number of other things. Murray is a real renaissance man, a Hollywood and Washington insider, and he's even an associate of the Dalai Lama. His books include Great Balls of Fire, The Uncensored Story of Jerry Lee Lewis, which was made into the movie of that name, starring Dennis Quaid and Winona Ryder. He is the author of a number of other books, including his memoirs, When Elvis Meets the Dalai Lama, and Behind the Moss Curtain, which are genuine, genuine paranormal stories about Savannah. And where his website is www.bonaventure.com. That's Bonaventure with two T's. Murray Silver, welcome back to Behind the Paranormal. How are you, Master Ben? Brother yeah. Paul? It's nice oh, to pretty fair, you pretty on fair. this chilly evening. Bad. Yeah, we're still digging out from our second snowstorm at this point. But. Uh, not as bad as the last one, but still, let's uh, get right into this. So, Murray, you've come to some uh, interesting conclusions about the paranormal influencing our well-being for the worse, yeah. including yeah. your own personal experiences. So, yeah. what's going on with that? Well, I tell you, I, um, I offered myself up as, um, as a case study, as it were, I um since I talked to you gentlemen last I've been very very sick. Uh last October I contracted an upper respiratory problem that became a lower respiratory problem turned into pneumonia and um I couldn't beat it. And after 2 months I finally uh, after trying all the things I mean respiratory has always been my weak spot I must say that at the outset. Whenever I get sick, I tend to get sick there. Um, after two months of, of doing all the things that I normally do to cope with the problem, I went to the hospital, and they gave me not one but three prescriptions, including an inhaler, and they gave me what is called a pneumonia pill. And um, after exhausting the, uh, the prescriptions, I was still sick. And I went back to the doctor, and I said, you know, I... I don't feel like you are reaching the root cause of the problem. You're just basically dealing with the symptoms here. I said, that thing down there that's caused this, you didn't hit it. And he had even given me an antiviral. So um, there became a point in this process when I felt so bad that I thought I was going to have to die to feel better. And I began entertaining thoughts of suicide. And by saying entertaining thoughts, I began making plans. Um, it wasn't simply born out of this physical dis-ease, but uh, like most people on this planet, I have been faced with a lot of reversals in the past year. On earlier programs, the three of us have talked about the great transition that the planet's been going through in the past two years, and we are at the tail end of now. And as we talked about, no one gets out of this unscathed. And finally, all of the things that had visited other people came to visit at my house. And since I talked to you last, I have uh, been to a long list of funerals. I have closed my business. I've had reversals and losses of every kind. And um, at one point, I thought, you know, um, all the good is gone. 
and I can't see any purpose for hanging around. And I must uh, I admit to you, embarrassingly enough, that I started making plans about uh, ending this life and getting on with it. Now, we've also talked to fellows in the past about the danger of suicide and the fact that it doesn't really resolve anything. And that, no. But that's when I began to really be concerned for myself because I thought, you know, this isn't coming from me. This idea isn't coming from me. And yet, at the same time, I did not know where it was coming from. And I tell you all of that to tell you this. One night at the end of last year, in December, right as we were approaching the new year, I got a call late at night from a, a friend of mine who is, a Ph.D. in acupuncture, Ph.D. This woman travels the world to study with masters. She makes frequent visits to China, and she, one of her gurus is a man who is 88 in his lineage of acupuncture experts. 88 generations his family has been in the business. That's Thousands like 2,500 years, years or yes. more. Yes. And so she is getting her Ph.D. from the source, from the well spring of, of acupuncture. And she called me out of the blue one night, and uh, she's a personal friend of my wife and I. She's a very dear friend of my wife. They're like sisters. She called me on the phone. She said, well, what's going on? And I said, well, you don't want to ask me a question like that. And I said, I don't have anything good to share with you. I said, Christina has gone to Brazil to care for her parents who are not well. And uh, she said, no, no, I'm, I'm not calling about Christina. I'm calling about you. I said, well, um, I'm not doing too well. And she said, well, um, I'm calling because I'm very worried about you. And I'm worried that you're going to do yourself harm. And I said to her, how, how do you know that? And why do you feel that way? She said, well, let's just put it this way. My people have been talking to your people. And she's not talking about our secretaries, gentlemen. Right. She's talking about spirit guides. She said, my people have been talking to your people, and your people say that you're in a lot of trouble. And so I said to her, I said, well, it is true. And I will admit it to you, although I haven't discussed this with anybody else. And I feel slightly funny that I'm talking to America now through your program, but I I have something important to say to your listeners that they may not hear anywhere else. And as embarrassing as this is to me, I think that it is important. We went through a process together, she and I, where I was able to locate and identify and expel hitchhiker spirit that had walked in on me and had taken up residence. And uh, it was remarkable to me the ease with which they can be located, identified, and expelled. That's the good news. The bad news is one of them had been hanging out with me for 50 years. And the remarkable thing was, gentlemen, let me jump ahead to tell you this. The next day, having gone through this process, this eviction, if you will, I woke up and felt as I would feel on the day that I was born. I, I spent literally three days sitting on the sofa doing nothing more than looking out the window, mesmerized. My vision had improved. Gone was all the chatter and noise that I had been hearing in my head for decades. Mm -hmm. I woke up to find that my habits had changed. It was the first solid sleep I'd had in years. I found out that my appetite had radically changed overnight, and literally nothing about my life was the same as it had been the day before. And I literally did not know what to think or how to think or what to do. And for several days, I could do virtually nothing but sit and stare and marvel at what had happened to me. Because I realized, gentlemen, that in the absence of these hitchhikers that had taken up residence inside me physically, that they had been calling the shots and dictating the agenda for so long that I could hardly remember the last time when I was free of them. Now, I tell you all of that to tell you this. Coincidentally, this month, I have been called into a case here in Savannah, Georgia, that is truly horrific. 
It makes all horror movies pale in comparison. It is a three-year-old boy who, on the day he was born, something evil walked in on this child and took over. And the things that are manifesting in this child's family and in their home is simply the most remarkable thing that I have seen anywhere on this planet, in movies, science fiction, fiction fact. What This is truly remarkable. This little boy is possessed by something that, when it's not trying to kill other people, is trying to kill this little boy. And he, it, it is... It is such an and difficult case that not even the Catholic Church, the diocese here in Savannah, can help these people. And these people are Catholic. And the diocese has told them that they can't help these people. And the doctors don't know what to do, the psychiatrists don't know what to do, because when they take a look at the little boy, this thing that possesses him runs and hides. And I tell you that to tell you this. I am now convinced, having been through this experience myself, that there's an awful lot of us running around on this planet right now who are sick, and that the root cause of the illness is not the individual, but the hitchhikers that we have picked up. How do you tell the difference? I will tell you how you I, I, Matter of fact, I'm going I'm to ask you that question after the break because we, we have a break coming up, and it's, it's good timing. So let's, uh, let, let's pick that up after the break, Murray. Uh, you're I, listening I got your to, answer. Okay, you're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on CBS New Sky Radio, and we're talking with Murray Silver this evening, our good friend. And we will be right back, so stay with us. Enlighten. Empower. Enrich. This is CBS Radio's The New Sky New horizons, no boundaries. Stop.
Psychic Radio is now CBS Radio's The Sky. Back to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Call now. 248-545-SOL. New SkyRadio.com. Leave. Well, welcome back. And we're having a rather sobering conversation with our dear friend Murray Silver, a paranormal investigator, historian, author. And uh, Murray, why don't, we were just about to discuss uh, how do you tell the difference between uh, an infestation, if you will, by what I suppose we ourselves would call parasites or whatever term you want to use, and something that is within you that is medical or psychiatric. It's a case. It's a thing I've faced many times myself. Well, first of all, um, what I noticed was um, if if we are dealing with the hitchhiker, as I call them, they desire things that maybe you don't. As I said, the day after this purge, I woke up and found out that I have absolutely no desire for beer or wine or alcohol. And I had been imbibing on a fairly frequent basis. But the odd thing was, for example, I was drinking uh, very expensive Belgian craft beers, and, but I, don't, I never really enjoyed it. And uh, as it turns out, there, one way you can tell if if the problem is not yours, but a hitchhiker, is the fact that you will desire things that bring you no joy, that you feel compelled to do that which does you harm or does not make you feel better, or that you find yourself desiring that which, when you have it, you don't understand why you're addicted to it in the first place, because you're not feeding your addiction, you're feeding theirs. That's the reason they've walked in on you. They are desirous of these things, they have no physical body with which to enjoy them. They walk in on you rather than go through the process of being reborn into a new and different life. They simply take a shortcut. And I'm beginning to think now that one of the, you know, something here's, here's a, a key issue that I wanted to bring up, gentlemen. In getting rid of my uh, hitchhikers, I got rid of one that's been with me for 50 years who argued with me on the way out that he was supposed to be there. Mm-hmm. He said, no, 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 I'm here to help you. You don't want to get rid of me. There's some other people in your waiting room that you ought to get rid of, but not me. I'm supposed to be here. Well, the person who was arguing with me was my grandfather, who committed suicide 50 years ago and spent the last night of his life sharing my room with me in the house that I'm now talking to you from. hmm and apparently that at the time that my grandfather's spirit got up and left him, uh, he more or less just jumped from one bed into the next. And as it turns out, my grandfather and I have been having a uh, rather close relationship for the past 50 years. I write Sweet. about him in my book. That book is a bestseller. He was here to help me make money in life. And yet it is odd, gentlemen, that 50 years later, when I run up against the very same circumstances that caused him to take his life, all of a sudden I began thinking, yeah, there's only one way out, and I'm going I'm to have to do it myself. And at that point I realized, wait a minute, this isn't coming from me. And it was really, it's truly bizarre. The circumstances in my life now are exactly like the ones that he faced when he took his life back in 1963. And that is when I found out that it wasn't me who was making these plans to commit suicide. It was my grandfather saying, let me show you how you get out of this jam. And you so mentioned... one way you can tell when you are dealing with a hitchhiker is you start having thoughts that are not your own, that you don't own, that you don't feel like it's coming from you, almost like a suggestion that you don't want to take. You have desires for things that bring you no joy or satisfaction. These are the, the, for me, these are the chief signs that I was feeding and catering to somebody else who had a very different agenda but had moved in on me because we had similar paths. We had similar connections. Uh, I was able to help them with their unfinished business. And I was arguing with the doctor who helped me. I said, well, isn't this what life is all about? Aren't we supposed to help the spirit of those who've moved on? She said, well, yeah, but they're not supposed to move in on you and run the show. 
So what I'm saying to you is, having gone through this process, I have a, a new and different and improved outlook on what spirit is capable of, what it can do, and the effects and the price that is paid when you court it. And I have a feeling, gentlemen, that there's an awful lot of us running around that are harboring hitchhikers, whether we know it or not. And I think that some of them come and go rather easily. Oh, I know that's it, true. Well, from a medical standpoint now, this doctor tells me that typically she finds that people who have a virus, a viral infection, is usually attendant to a, a disembodied spirit having moved in on them and then moving away. So she says that catching a disembodied spirit is just like catching a cold. And she says it is her theory that it comes and goes many times in our lives. And in the Chinese way of thinking, gentlemen, this is nothing. What I've just gone through is nothing new. The Chinese have been talking about this for thousands of years. In fact, mm -hmm. it's fascinating to me that acupuncture has what they call ghost points on the body. And by stimulating these points, you're able to give ghosts the exit to get them out. And so you can easily, you can, you can Google this, you can look this up yourself. It's easy to, to find. But there are points on the body called the ghost points that are manipulated if you want to rid yourself of this energy. And as I said, it's a very easy thing to do because once you've found them and told them to go, they have to go. Now, some of them are going to put up a fight. Some are going to argue. But the interesting thing is, is that it's just like if you've got somebody who comes and stays for the weekend and decides they don't want to go home on Monday. At a certain point, when they got to go, they got to go, and you will give them the gate, and they've got to go. By by one way or the other, they're leaving. So my point to you is, it's no different with the, with the human body. But what was fascinating to me is that after I had evicted this company, the tremendous shift in me mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. I mean, it was like being born again, and it was absolutely the most, the single most phenomenal thing I have ever been through in my 60 years on this planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you and I are exactly the same age. Uh, I, I've had a lot of experience with what are commonly called demons, but I have never been, as far as I know, through what you have described. I can't speak for Ben, of course. But I, I, um, I, I'm intrigued that, that you feel, and most people do, that these can be or are human essences, human spirits without their bodies. Obviously, I think that I, I'm speaking... That's correct, right? You do believe that that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and I—I I don't know. I just—I—I—I. I, I, uh, you're the one who went through it, and I, I've said many times that I agree that there. I see no reason why a human who is a parasite in life doesn't become one. You know, in 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 life here, it doesn't become where whatever next life they go to. Um, okay. You know, and uh, but I myself must say that that with uh, and, and most of my experience has been in psychiatric hospitals with with this sort of thing. Um, well, has Paul, not... you touch on, so when you talk about psychiatric hospitals, let me say this to you. My 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 existence for the last several years, my normal state of existence was, I always had these conversations going on in my head, constantly. Most voices, do. which I thought were mine, I like yeah. my, like your conscience and so forth, only to find out that it wasn't. They were so close to me that I thought they were. They were not me. Mm -hmm. For I'll give you a perfect example. If I was at the beach, and I'm I'm done with my walk and I get in the car, I would say to myself, "Well, what do I want to do now?" And a voice would invariably come back and say, "How about pizza? Let's go get pizza." And I would say, "Yeah, pizza. Let's go get." It would be a conversation with myself, and I thought that's who I was talking to. Turns out that my company was chiming in on what it is that they wanted for dinner. And the remarkable thing is I said to you that oftentimes, I mean, my diet now is nothing like the diet that I have had for the last several years because, as it turns out, they were pretty much ordering what they wanted for dinner whether I wanted it or not. And so what I'm saying to you is that I now keenly understand what the psychotic says when they say to the doctor, there's a voice telling me to do things, and it's not me. And I am confident that I know what it is they're talking about because I had a voice telling me that the only way I could solve my problem was to kill myself. And that voice was not coming from me, gentlemen. Thank God. Oh, no, I've seen it, seen it many times. Ben, do you have any thoughts on this? You've tangled with these things, too. 
although on a different level than I do. Well, I mean, I can understand where the sickness thing comes from because I remember last year, uh, actually last semester when I was still at uh, community college over here, I was, I had this cold for like two weeks and it would just, just wouldn't end. And like, I actually went on for about a month and a half. Like, yeah. It, it oh, no, yeah. That, wouldn't end. And I remember I was driving in my car over to school and I don't remember if it was like, like the over the counter medications I was on, but I was like, you know. I should just be positive about this. And as soon as I said that, everything that was in my sinuses just drained right out of my face. And I was just like, wow, I feel much better now. <laughs> like, yeah, it yeah. just It just didn't make much sense at the time. I was like, why did I just do this in the first place? Like a month and a half of this. And I mean, we, we talk about the same things. We just use different words for describing them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and again, you know, Murray's the one who went through this. I, you know, I, I, you know how I feel about Murray. We both. No, feel I know about, exactly what he's saying. Yeah. I, that sort of thing happened to me before, if you recall. Yeah, yeah. When I was. Yes, I, I did. I didn't want to bring it up, but I remember. I don't like bringing it up either, but I'm just saying I know what Murray's talking about. Like, yeah, yeah. Except not with the suicide. It was other no. things. But it, it has happened to you. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. A long time ago, but it did. Yeah, it was four, four or five years. And now. I kind of people, uh, if, if, if what kind of father were you? You saw this going on, and 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 I said, well. But but I, I knew it was something you kind of had to experience. Yeah. In a funny way, and so it takes a lot of explanation. But so, so we're we're with you, Marie, on that. I mean, personally, <laughs> I have not, and this could be just me. I have not encountered one of these things that I thought was or had ever been a human being. Uh, I know maybe that's because there was so little humanity left, and I've admitted that many times. But personally, my experience is that, is that they're, for lack of a better term, alien. Now, I could be wrong. I don't know. Your, your experience uh, uh, indicates that. But I would ask you this. Uh, for example, on the diet thing, if these are disembodied spirits, why would they need food? Well, they, they still desire it. When, when spirit leaves the body, it is still subject to desire. The problem is it doesn't have a body to satisfy the desire. But that doesn't mean it's still the. In fact, uh, in the Asian, the Eastern way of thought, uh, ghosts are referred to as hungry ghosts. They're exactly. Because yes, they, they are. They, yeah. they are hungry. And they have no ability to eat. And in fact, it is fascinating when you think back on the story of Jesus Christ when he appeared to his disciples after he had been crucified, died, and had risen. When he appeared before them, they thought he was a ghost. And the way he proved to them he was not a ghost was he ate a piece of bread, because as they knew, ghosts exactly. could not eat. Right. And that's what Christ himself did to prove to his own disciples he wasn't a ghost. The bottom line is death does not defeat desire in spirit. And spirit out of the body still desires things, and that's what typically leads it back into life. However, you're supposed to go the long way, that is, to go back to the birth process, only I'm now beginning to think that for an awful lot of disembodied spirit, they take a shortcut, and they walk into the first available thing they can find. Now, that being said, Jim, I want to say something to you that I also find fascinating. It is also the belief of a lot of Asian cultures that the human spirit does not enter the physical body until 10 days after the baby is born. They do not believe that it enters the womb, as some people believe. In fact, um, in ancient Japanese culture, they did not bother to name a baby for 10 days until after it was born, because a lot of babies, if they fail to thrive, it happens in the first 10 days. And so consequently, it's not considered to be fully alive until it's 10 days old, and spirit has descended upon it. So it may be... And, cause it, and the reason I bring this up is that this is the problem that science has always had. Science cannot prove if there is a spirit or a soul or, or how it enters the body or when or when it leaves. And so this has been the primary problem that you and I have had in discussing what ghosts are, because science, right. science doesn't even acknowledge the existence of spirit. So consequently, it's fascinating that, that even those of us who study this are not exactly sure when it enters the body. And well, what I'm going to have to interrupt to you there, Murray, because we have to take a break. Okay, so well, we will be right back on Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on CBS New Sky Radio. We'll be right back with our good friend, Mary Silver, to continue our discussion. Stay with us. Enlighten. Empower. Enrich. This is CBS Radio's The New Sky. New horizons. No boundaries. I've 
just close my eyes again Climbed aboard the dream weave a train Trying to take away my worries of today And leave tomorrow Psychic Radio is now CBS Radio's The Sky. Back to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Call now. 248 545 Soul. New SkyRadio.com. Believe. And we're back with our distinguished guest, Marie Silver, and we're talking about uh, the human body kind of being, in his opinion, sort of a sieve where the spirit passes in and out and different personalities, things of this kind. And I've seen that in a way myself in my own work, and certainly uh, Marie has, has experienced it, and Ben is somewhere in there too. <laughs> and so I'm in the middle somewhere. What, what I'm, uh, I'm wondering here, Murray, is, is the complication that is introduced by the concept that I happen to believe in, and that's that... In, in some part of this vast interactive series and system of, of multiple worlds that we are all these different people anyway at some point. And, and the nature of spirituality is, first of all, stopping the chatter. That's number one, learning yeah. to be alone, taking control and experiencing what is best in all these lives so that we be, can become better people. I mean, what, how, how does all this fit into what you've said? Or does well, I think I think you're right on the money. I, uh, I was recently talking to a friend of mine who was a U.S. Marine, um, and at the age of 17, he left high school during the Vietnamese War, and they turned him into the poster boy for the movement. He was one of the most highly decorated soldiers in the Vietnamese uh, uh, conflict, and I asked him. I said, um, "How how did you make that transition?" He said, "Well." We were very well trained. They and that what they what they were able to do is they were able to instill in him that spirit, what they call the esprit de corps. They take a person and infuse them with that fighting spirit. It is something that can be transmitted. It it is something that you don't just talk about and study, but it actually has to take over. It has to move in on you. And he spoke of the tremendous transformation that he went through in the process. So. That's just one example of what we talk about when we talk about spirit overcoming you. 
and and I, I often think that that there that our guides it's part of our process our guides do this to help us um, to, to move us through this lifetime it's a matter of karma but the downside of it is this when you find um, that you are not in control when you find that you have no peace of mind when you lay down at night and the conversation continues when you find that you are, are, are moving away from that, from your own comfort zone and you're, you're now engaging in risky behaviors, when you find yourself doing things when people say, you know, that's not like you, or where's that coming from? These are all signals that maybe somebody else is now overstepping their boundary and they're no longer helping or their help is now costing you more than it's worth. And so I have a solution. If 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 there are any if there's anyone in your audience who begins to feel that this is sounding familiar to them, this is what you can do to find out if you've got hitchhikers of your own. It's a very easy process. There's no hocus pocus here. It's a simple thing to do. When you are in a state of rest, when you are lying down and you are quiet, you simply ask the question out loud, who's in there? You simply ask the question. And if you don't get a response from that, those voices that have been talking constantly in your head, you can take your thumb and exert pressure where the upper lip meets the, the bridge of the nose, the bottom of the nose. There's a very sensitive pressure point there. And by pressing it, Continuously, by pressing this, you're able to get inside of yourself and you continue to ask the question and you would be surprised that these people are anxious to tell you who they are because chances are you already know. It won't come as a surprise to you when, when they tell you who they are because it's probably someone that you know. It's probably someone you've had a relationship with. It won't come as a surprise. Once you find out who that is, you simply ask them, well, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And they will tell you. Just as if somebody had walked up to your house and knocked on the door, and you open the door and you say, well, what are you here for? They will tell you. And at that point, you instruct them, well, you know something? Uh, this is all well and good, but it's time for you to go. And at that, at that point, if this is what you want, because it's funny, Jim, a lot of people – they may not want their company to go. Uh, the company may even argue with you. In, in my case, my grandfather said, no, no, I'm, I'm supposed to be here. I'm here to help you. I'm helping you. And I, I'm supposed to be here. So they will argue with you. But I told my grandfather, I said, uh, if, if you are suggesting that I should kill myself to solve the problems that I have, then you're not helping me. And so at that point, gentlemen, we begin the eviction process. And Ben already touched on one of the key elements. You have to first fill your heart with love and joy. And you have to let them know that they are leaving now and they're going to move toward the light. And at that point, gentlemen, the light beings come in to help them make this transition that they missed when they died and left the body, and they did not make the transition. Now the transition begins, and they find themselves lifted up and, and moving toward that light that they had missed way back when. And so to stimulate the exit physically from your body, you manipulate what the Chinese have always called the ghost points. They are, oddly enough, the tips of your fingers, the tips of your toes where the nail meets the skin at the corner. Not at the bottom at the cuticle, but at the top at the corners. By pressing on these spots, it opens the portal that allows spirit to leave the body. However, I have discovered that a lot of these spirits will reside within a bodily organ and this is typically for people who are overweight. They, they typically reside in the midsection. They are stored in the fat. And it's, it's an odd thing, but, but you find that people who are addicted to sugar and alcohol, usually carrying hitchhikers, 
those are sticky substances, and spirit adheres itself to those things. Typically, people who are who are who are troubled by spirit, they have an addiction to sweets, to alcohol, and so it is phenomenal that the day after I went through this process, I I woke up and I no longer had a desire for either, and I tried to. Well, in the case of sugar, that's a tougher thing because it's in so much of the food that we eat. But I tell you, gentlemen, there has not been one single drop of alcohol since then. I do not desire it as much as I thought I enjoyed it. I have no desire for it. And well, I have so two it, questions. Sure. If I may. One is, I'm a little nervous about the light. I don't know, I have a voice crying in the wilderness. Everybody says, go to the light. But I've found that the light is simply a boundary to another world. That world uh-huh. could be a hell. Mm-hmm. So I always tell people to be very careful if you, quote, send anybody to the light because you could be sending them to hell. You know, and you never yeah. hear from them again. Everybody goes, aha, well, they went to heaven. Well, we, you know, that's that's just not the way I've experienced it. It just isn't. So well, I'd say Paul, be very I'll, careful I'll, with that. I, I understand. I understand what you are saying. But to me, hell is not what... Um, a lot of people traditionally think that hell is. My understanding of hell, I have a different take on that just as with just about everything well, as else. as do I. When I say hell, I mean ultimate aloneness. But, but my point to you is that, that I find that I'm going through this process that when the Spirit left me, that it was drawn away from me towards something mm-hmm. that was better than this existence, that beings came to help it make this transition in other words, the doctor sent her people to come and get my people, and I saw them meet up. Now, I have to tell you, the physical proof that this is going on is the first of all, the room you're in is going to turn very, very cold. As spirit leaves your body, the room is going to get very, very, very cold. And I must tell you, and I tell you this um, with a great deal of sadness, that when my grandfather left me, I audibly heard a low mournful moan as if it was his last breath when he left when when he was evicted and he left and he moved actually out of the side of me like at the level of the liver i actually felt and saw him depart and heard him leave and it was a pathetic thing because i felt that i was casting him out well he might have passed from the life he was living in which he could help you and pass to another and I must admit to you, I, I have felt a great deal of regret and remorse since he's been gone because, to tell you the truth, gentlemen, on certain levels, I miss him. I miss, I miss, the, I miss the fact that this was someone that I was going through this life with and, and someone who had helped me and who I thought that I was helping. But, at, 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 again, as the doctor pointed out to me, at such a point, his best advice is suicide that's not a friend that you need when you're in the kind of trouble that you're in. You believe that was your grandfather telling you that? Well, that was the that was the uh, that was the solution that he chose, Paul. That I was the uh, that, that he really chose. floors me. I've 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 never encountered that. I just I can't. Uh, I mean, again, you're the one who experienced it, not me. But I, I can't really conceive what I have run into a million times is is these things pretending to be loved ones and being believed right and left by everybody in the family. I don't know. Again, you, you, I, I can't speak for you. you can only, I can only speak for what I've experienced. But, but my second question, uh, I guess I'll ask it after we uh, take the break because we're coming up on another break. Um, we'll, we'll have to, you know, it's related to the first one I asked. But in any case, uh, we'll be right back with our friend Murray Silver on CBS New Sky Radio, Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. So stay with us. Enlighten, empower, enrich. This is CBS Radio's The New Sky. New horizons, no boundaries.
Gig Radio is now CBS Radio's The Sky. Back to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Call now. 248-545-SOUL. New SkyRadio.com. Leave. Welcome back to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. And we have with us the magnificent Murray Silva. How do you uh, like that, Murray? That's I, a I nice introduction. Yeah, well, I could I couldn't think of another really interesting alliteration because that'd have to be like the magnificent uh, something. I can't think of any other M words that are positive. So off the top of my head, well, Murray's positive. All right, okay. Well, thank you, Ben. You're welcome, uh, Murray. Another question. Of, uh, my second question about the light here is, yeah. it, it, I, I've never found any of these to be human. But again, other people do, and I'm rare in my opinion. If it isn't human, if it is one of the nine different species of, of parasitical entities that I happen to have, yeah. uh, I, I feel, identified over the, the years, yeah. um, why would they be going to the light? What would occur? I mean, they're simply, you're sending, I think it's not a bad idea because you're sending them out of your, your current stream of consciousness, your current yeah. world. Um, have you ever encountered, because I, I don't know, have you ever encountered any of these you feel was not human? I have, but here's the interesting thing. I I think that one of the key the keys is that, um, and it's even in the case of this little three year old boy who's bedeviled by something truly horrific, that joy and and happiness around him will cause the thing to recede and abate. I agree with that. And yeah. and, and, and and joy and love is is the cure for what ails you, as it turns out. Very true. And and that is why uh, people are admonished. People who are in our 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 uh, field of study, paranormal, it, we are we are the prime candidates for this to happen, because as it turns out, anybody that hangs around a cemetery is likely to pick up disembodied spirit. This is a no-brainer, and so consequently, people who are bumping around cemeteries looking for ghosts, they're going to find one. But I, as I've as you and I have always been warning people. The chances are you can take them home with you. I always thought that that meant they were going to simply tag along in the back seat of your car. I've I, actually I, had that happen. <laughs> well, I have too, but the thing is that I, I also failed to understand because I, it, I had never experienced it. I did not know that they can move even closer by moving in. Now, I theoretically I always believed it, but I don't talk about anything, gentlemen, that I have not experienced myself, and that mm-hmm. is why I'm on your show tonight yep. to tell you what I've experienced. And disembodied spirit moved in on me and took over. And it is a dangerous thing what it does because it makes you sick. It can make you crazy. And, and consequently, this is the cautionary tale for anyone who's interested in chasing ghosts as a hobby. It's not a good idea. Well, I'm glad you, you got might into catch that. one, and then you have a real problem. I'm glad you got into that because we hadn't gotten into it yet. I wanted to get into how this can mess up people who, th- who could treat this like bird watching. Now, in my experience, there are cemeteries and there are cemeteries. There, there's one, uh, we, we live not far from Concord, Massachusetts, and uh, the graves of, of people who were cousins of my families, Henry David Thoreau, um, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. It is the most wonderful, peaceful place. Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. Sounds like something out of Washington Irving. Mm-hmm. And then there, there is one... Well, I was just going to say, all I can think of is Ichabod Crane. Yeah, Ichabod well, I haven't met anybody without a head. Yet, but uh, it's the most peaceful place in the world. Other places, as you say, are just. I'm thinking of one in in New Hampshire, where you orbs follow you around. You hear uh, strange things going on and that kind of thing. So I guess there are cemeteries and there are cemeteries. But nevertheless, I think uh, it is. It needs to be stressed that people who are out there treating this as though they were fishing or 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 bird watching or something or collecting butterflies ought to really watch out. And so, Murray, why don't you say some more about that? Well, I'll tell you what happened to me. After I went through this process at the beginning of this year, Paul, the thing that truly astounded me, to let you, to answer your question as to whether this was disembodied spirit or parasite or alien, the thing that proved to me that this was spirit was I got phone calls from people that I hadn't heard from in years who were in the paranormal business. One of them called me from Key West, Florida an old friend of ours that you know, and he called me on the phone. He said to me, Murray, he said, I'm driving down the street. Something told me to call my old friend Murray. I said, why? He said, well, I don't know. He said, it just popped into my head that I should call you. I said, well, tell me what you're going through. He said, well, 
I moved down here. I got married. I'm in a lot of trouble. I, my business is in trouble. Uh, I don't know what to do. I'm trying to get out of the paranormal business. It won't let me out. He said to me that um, he was beset with all of these problems and so forth. And I said, you know, I, here's the reason I think you're calling me. I think your people have been talking to my people, and your people want you to know that what you need is a cleansing, that you need to get rid of these hitchhikers that you've picked up uh, through the years doing what you do. Because at one point in time, Paul, he had a television show, and he mm -hmm. was doing these conventions for people, and he, he was well-known throughout this country in the paranormal circle. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Can't get out of the business, driving him crazy. And I told him, I said, I think this is the reason you've called me, and I think that that's what had happened. I think spirit... Spirit, my people talk to your people, and all of a sudden now you're calling me to find out what to do. Um, so it, it makes me feel like this was a disembodied human spirit, not parasite, not alien. But, but I must tell you, yes, I have known cases of walk-ins that were harboring uh, Pleiadians. I have known of these. I have, I have met one of these people. In fact, I write about one in my memoir, a doctor in Atlanta who is a Pleiadian and, and will sit there and tell you, it won't blink an eye, and it will tell you straight to your face that that's what she is. And so I, I agree with you, Paul. It's possible for alien to move through us. Yeah. Um, it's possible for a lot of things to move through us. We're, we are we're filled with holes, and actually it's very easy for spirit to move it and out of us. But the point that I'm making to you is that you and I have always been cautioning people who are interested in ghosts as a hobby. This makes a lot a lousy hobby. There's a price to be paid. What I'm describing to you is what happened to me while I was trying to get to the bottom of the subject of spirit. And all I can tell you is that this is not some, this is to be avoided. And if, however, if you've got it, if you too have picked up the virus, it's an easy thing to get rid of. Mm -hmm. Well, Murray, thank you. Good news. That, that, that's excellent. I, I, I wish we had more time, but we don't, but we'll have you back. We'll talk some more about this. I want to talk about detachment. Uh, but in any case, we're uh, we're just about out of time. But Murray Silver, thank you so very much. We're glad that you have had a positive experience and have made progress in that. Indeed. You're never uh, you and I are the same age. We, you're never too old to learn and to, and to get better and and to, and to take a step in the right direction. And and that that thank you for sharing everything you shared this evening. Well, it's my pleasure. I, I'm always thrilled to talk to you, Paul, and I hope that I have the pleasure of seeing you and your son sometime very soon. I hope we'll be down real soon, brother. Thanks that, very that, much. That would be wonderful. Okay, excellent. Okay, folks, Murray Silver. I just one final comment yeah, ben, before, please. before we finish, start our outro. I was just going to say, because we were going back and forth about our experiences and stuff, and one final thought on that is that ultimately we are the culmination of all our experiences. Yeah, you know, that's right. That's true. And we have to make the best of that. Yes. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. So, so many thanks to our producer, Brandon Jackson. It's my line. <laughs> uh, so many thanks to our producer, Brandon Jackson, and we will see you right here next week, February 24th, when my dad and I will host an open line show to answer your questions. Uh, see BehindTheParanormal.com for a question form, or email Paul at BehindTheParanormal.com or Ben at BehindTheParanormal.com. In the meantime, tune into our Boston Providence Drive Time Show on WON 1240 AM and ON Worldwide at 6 p.m. Eastern every Monday. And check out the almost 450 free podcasts of past shows at BehindTheParanormal.com. And we leave you this evening with a thought that might send some explanation, need some explanation for you neophytes out there. In the, uh, in the quote is the word telekinesis, essentially meaning the movement of objects by invisible, non-physical means, uh, as in... Poltergeist phenomenon. This witty statement came from the well-known author Kurt Vonnegut. Quote, those who believe in telekinesis, raise my hand. Unquote. <laughs> Thanks for joining us in our great cosmic journey, and we shall see you next time. <laughs>